نعم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله Are these all are these separated? Are they all all the questions are in there? Can you can you spark them for? Yeah, just put them in from the ladies and from yeah. I just want to know which one is which because if we run out of time, I want to I want to make sure everyone gets an equal chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? What's the example of how about <coughs> time travel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, these are all they're all theories, right? Um, so that's that's one interpretation that Sheikh Imran draws from that is with regards to the knowledge of the book. containing knowledge pertaining such a manipulation of sorts a manipulation of space and time in this regard you could say yeah it's an interpretation though it's an interpretation there's one of two ways to look at it number one if we say that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can control time because he's the only one who has a full measure of time right Um, then we say that no creation can manipulate time in that regard. Yeah. Then whatever else that they do becomes an illusion, an illusion of it, an illusion of a manipulation of time. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, I don't believe that. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, if I just even if you look at the physics itself, just physics itself, it's it's not a possibility. There, in fact, when you now analyze it from metaphysical point of views, it's just not a possibility. It's come. It's an impossibility amongst. So there are three categories in which things are classified under. There are necessities, things just that have to happen. Then there are possibilities, things that have a possibility of occurrence. Such a thing like time travel is an impossibility. It's just not there. For instance, if you take into account, for example, how consciousness works, I mean, they don't know how consciousness works. We also have a limited understanding of how consciousness works, but we have a better understanding than they do in that regard. The idea of consciousness is time is bound to time, so comprehension takes place in a forward progression of time. If you regress that, then what you're essentially saying that that consciousness would be if you're traveling back in time. Then you are unknowing what you have, what you knew, and and that doesn't doesn't work. Let's let's take an example of the last what thirty seconds have passed in this questioning. If we if we travel back in time thirty seconds, will you have asked this question? And here's the question we'd ask then. On top of that, do you do would you have known the words that I have just given you, or will you unknow them? Will you hence then be in a state of not knowing, as opposed to a state of knowing? If you look at human history in its entirety, knowledge is cumulative. Knowledge is cumulative. Like we we know more than our predecessors would have known, if you want to document everything. Not 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 just in terms of the quality of knowledge, but just how much we know in that regard. See, so if you travel back in time, are you undoing that then? Or are you uh, or are you accumulating that knowledge? And if you're accumulating it, then why is it going in a regression instead of a progression? It, there's just way too many issues with any of those theories. In a, in terms of a manipulation, it's more a manipulation of space than a manipulation of time. So if you can manipulate space, then time seems like it's. So Einstein's theory was not in terms of manipulating time. Einstein's theory of relativity was in terms of manipulating space. See, he theorized that if you could go, travel faster than the speed of light. Now, if I turn on, if you turn on that switch, it takes less than a second for the light to come on, for us to see it. Less than a second. Imagine if you could travel faster than that. What does that do to the to human perception? 
because there's a frequency in which your eyes work. There's a range of frequency in which your eyes work. There's a range of frequency in which your ears work. And all of those are bound to time. So if something's moving faster than that, then it seems as though it just appeared in an instance or disappeared in an instance. It was there and now it's not there and you have no idea what happened in between the two. The, the, the initial event is different from the final event or the initial condition is, is different from the final condition. You see? And so it creates the illusion of magic or illusion of power or illusion of control. It's an illusion in that regard. Yeah. Now, these, are these the ones? These are from? Okay. All right. I'll do that. Let me do this. No. Okay. All right. Let's take, I'm going to take one and then I'll take another just to make sure that everyone has a chance. Inshallah. So these are from, okay. Okay. So this is from the ladies. You mentioned, you mentioned a hundred lies in a truth from hadith but later you said margins magicians magicians put one lie in a hundred truths can you clarify and then the second question can you please elaborate universals and particulars uh, so a hundred lies in a truth that's from the hadith about what the kahina do that's what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said every truth that they give is dressed up in a hundred lies well it can work bo both ways yeah it can work both both ways so for 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 a magician to make something more convincing they will probably include the lie and then dressing dress it up with hundreds of facts Hundreds of facts, not really truths in that regard, but facts, yes, facts which sound plausible, they sound reasonable. And since, oh, this is right and this is right and this is right, therefore this must also be right. So, but that's the lie, understand? So they dress it up in that way to produce, this one is right, this one is so The initial conditions are given to you as being right. And because now your understanding is based on that neuroscience of deception that we discussed, since the initial condition is right, then the final condition must be right as well. The fortune tellers do something similar of the sort. So say they got only one truth and so many different lies. Now, how do they convince you? How do they convince you of that? See, so the prophet saying of this is not quantitative. It's a qualitative statement. It's to give you the understanding of how much lying uh, is involved in that in them saying things like they could use two lie uh, two they could use one truth and one lie and still convince you <laughs> or they could use one truth and a hundred lies it's to emphasize how much of an extent it could be yeah ah uh, yeah universals and particulars universals are like comprehensives and then particulars are like semantics. That's how you would look at it. So a universal is like, you know, when they say to see the forest for the trees, forests are like, the trees are like the details. The forest is like the tagline, the, the, the topic. So you have the topic and then you have what the topic is discussing with all the details in it. Now, the way it works is that every universal has particulars then those particulars are also universals to other particulars. And then those particulars are universals to other particulars. So you, you see the hierarchy goes like that. Now, when we say focus on the universals and not the particulars, it means once you've understood what the particulars are, you need to keep moving. Don't get hung up on semantics is what we say. The process of knowledge is in, is in uh, it's very complex to explain right now in a few minutes, but the, the process of knowledge is to build your understanding to a more universal level so that as you continue down that path, you ultimately come to the ultimate universal, the, the, the true unity, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we say that if you're not headed in that direction, then you're not on a path of knowledge. If you're stuck on the semantics only, you see, so you have semantic scholars and they get into a lot of debates and arguments and this, that and the other. And what they find is they always get conflicting results. So, I mean, even in the, the, the study that we did, we saw there's some hadith say this, some hadith say that. How do you, 
You see, you have to you have to build a universal understanding from both of them. You can't just get hung up on the semantics. Now, so that was from here. What sort of options are available for Muslims in the end of time? I think you meant the end of times, not the end of time. Time is not ending. Times, the end of times in this case is uh, the meaning of the end of times be, you know, our times, Akhirul Zaman, human history. And this is an interesting thing. I mean, work on this, you know, refine your language and be specific in your ter terms. When we say end of the world, the impression created is that the world is ending. But this is an egocentric projection of it in thinking that because humanity ends, therefore the world will also end. Well, the world's not going anywhere yet. Humanity is ending, but there's still some continuum that will take place until everything is rebuilt and all that after afterwards. The end of times pertains human history ending. Okay? Not the end of time itself. So when we say when time began, it's really an expression that has to be understood. It doesn't mean that time itself began. It just meant insofar as human beings are concerned, <laughs> our time began at that time. Okay. Now, so what, what are options available for Muslims in the end of times? There are only four options, universal options. And you, you should have understood by now. I don't talk about particulars. I talk about universals. Okay. If you understand them, then you know any particular you can understand that going back to that previous question there are only four options available to you and these four are found in surah al-kahf the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that surah al-kahf is your protectant therefore follow what surah al-kahf gives you there are four options you can either follow the path of ashab al-kahf and make hijrah and isolate yourselves okay that's option one Option two, you can be content with where you are and live in the poverty and destitution that you are in. Where you are, stay where you are, but don't aim for any materiality. If you don't aim for any materiality, you will be left in destitution. That the Dajjal is going to leave you to suffer in destitution. Be content with that as the poor man and the rich man, that dialogue goes. Be content with your position. The rich man was arrogant about it. The poor man said, I am happy with what I have, what little Allah has given me. So stay where you are, be content with that, maintain your Iman, strengthen yourself from within. The third option, which I recommend, well, I recommend all of them. In fact, let me conclude. I'll, I'll tell you what my recommendation is from that. The third option is the path of Musa and Al-Khidr. Seek out knowledge, learn as much as you can, learn the right knowledges, learn the proper, the praiseworthy knowledges. If you read Imam Al-Ghazali's uh, Ihya Ulumuddin, the first book, Kitab Al-Ilm, he explains to you in great detail what, what kind of knowledges are praiseworthy and are applicable in your world, in your life here, as well as cultivated towards your Akhirah. Follow the kind of knowledge that is Majma al Bahrain, not just demonstrative physical material knowledges. Knowledges that have a spiritual element as well. And then bring them together. Find what was the commandment to Musa was to seek out Majma al Bahrain. Seek out Majma al Bahrain. The third option, which I believe, the fourth option, which I believe is the most difficult of all to implement unless you have the power, the strength, the resources and the control and all that is the path of Dhul Qarnayn. If you are able to fight the oppressor, fight the oppressor. But you cannot just fight because you have the power and strength. You have to fight with hikmah. You have to know where to fight and when to fight and how to fight. It's not just oh, start beating, you know, running on the streets and burning flags. That's not fighting for Islam. That's not fighting for Islam. It's not oh, jihad, jihad, jihad everywhere. No. Those are the four options you have available to you. And Dhul Qarnayn's option is not establish Khilafah. So don't take that as an option. I'm, that's not what it means. Understand what Dhul Qarnayn's position is. If you have the integrity to be a leader as Dhul Qarnayn, then follow that path. Establish Khilafah, establish Khilafah, establish Khilafah. That's not going to work. And you can't justify that part of the Quran. 
Don't do that. My recommendation is strive to achieve all of these at the same time. Make your hijra, isolate yourself away from the cities and all this debauchery. Number two, be content with what you have wherever you are. Wherever you're going to make hijra, even if it is in some remote village where you don't have that many resources or comforts or whatnot, be content with that. Number three, don't worry about the worldly possessions and how you're going to achieve all that. As long as you're able to secure your basic necessities, establish a purpose of seeking knowledge and increase yourself in that knowledge. Number four, if you are able to establish some sort of leadership, then build a community and expand from there. Okay, and this I believe are some of the efforts that are being made by some many Muslim communities around the world that um, also Sheikh Imran Hussein is also trying to get, um, you know, what they call the Muslim village. Right. So these are the these are the options that are available to you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide everyone in their means and ability to achieve that. But so long as your intention is clear, if your intention is not clear, whatever pursue you go for, it's going to be based on that. So if you are doing hijra or you're doing knowledge or you're doing this, whatever, whatever option you apply, if your intention has to be clear. Innamal a'malu bin niyat. That's the first principle. So your niya should be sincere. What are you doing it for? If you're doing it for some earthly possession, some worldly possession, then I mean you have to be clarified in you know in your mind as well exactly what you are trying to achieve. Now I am still confused. I'm still confused what about about what you said. I'm still confused about what you said about understanding their languages. Can you elaborate? Okay, Bismillah. Language has got two elements. There is this semantic form of language, which we would call English, Urdu, Arabic, Swahili, French, German, all those. Those are semantic forms, semantic forms. And then there is language in essence where you have meaning. Okay. When I say understand their language, I'm not referring to the semantic form. I'm referring to the meanings that are articulated by them. Those meanings can be articulated in English or in any other language. It's what is the rhetoric behind it? What is the logic behind it? What is the essence? What is being conveyed? How is it being conveyed? Where is the sophistry in the language as well? So some of the terminologies that they use, you might look them up in the English dictionary and get a dictionary definition, but that's not what they mean by it. And there is a sort of conditioning that takes place with language. Okay, because we this is a principle. Language defines thought and thought Thoughts cultivate your worldview. So if you cling to their language and speak the way they speak with the meanings that they affiliate them with, then your worldview will be cultivated in accordance to their worldview and their language. Which is why we say adhere to the Quran's language. And by that we don't only mean the semantic form of the Arabic language, but the meanings of the Quran. Because those meanings will cultivate your worldview your thoughts and your worldview in accordance to revelation. In the same mannerism that the, the Prophet and the companions and all the ulama, their worldview was cultivated accordingly. Understand? Now it's much more complex than that to go into the science of explaining how exactly it will work. But the point you have to always remember is that there is a distinction between the two. Now, naturally, you have to learn the semantic form of the language as well. So if you're not good in English, you should learn and polish up your English. I mean, you know, some of the mistakes I've seen in your questions already. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm just joking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have to polish up. You have to polish up on the on the semantic forms as well. And when you polish them up and here's the here's the interesting thing. The more words you learn, OK, in any language, the more words you learn, the more you increase your vocabulary. This has been proven, okay, in, in, in neuro-linguistic programming. The new 
in your brain, new neural pathways are established. There's an entrainment that takes place. You're training your brain to have newer connections. What that does for you is it increases your intellective ability. Your mind is able to analyze better and faster and more broader. And the, and the, and the greater your intellective ability, the greater your ability to understand and comprehend. So you'll be able to see things that normal people will be looking at the same thing, the same system, the same concept, the same everything. You'll be able to understand more from those things than they would be able to. You will see what others cannot see. You will understand what others cannot understand. So learn language. The more you learn, the better. And Arabic language, focus more on that. Don't worry about the English language. It's, it's a useless. It's not that whatever it's not because you want to understand the speech of Allah so you want to entrain yourself in the way the Quran speaks don't worry about how they speak so much don't get focused or hung up too much on their ideologies if you want to study in that regard and go further and investigate more then the best way to do it is first establish yourself in the Islamic sciences then yeah venture out and look at the others no. No. <clears throat> okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you say you're refined, you're good, and then all of a sudden you do something which you think is wrong. Well, in terms of the calculation, I would advise you don't do that because then you're going to fall into predictive aspects. Yeah. See, you don't want to start calculating time, when he's going to come, when did he leave, and then plus 3,000 years, plus 2,000 and all that stuff. You don't want to do that because, I mean, you don't know, right? You don't know. There's no hard evidence that you can use to make calculations. Plus, if you're making calculations based on calendars, the question here is which calendar do you use? I mean, you could use the Hijri calendar, okay, number one, or you could use the Hebrew calendar because he's their Messiah. So his time of coming and going might be aligned to, to their time frame, their calendar. Now, you could use the Gregorian calendar, but that's got some issues as well. Because number one, it's based on the solar system. So it's count as far as the lunar system is off. And number two, it went through a couple of changes through history. Because what was initially the Julian calendar from Julius Caesar was then changed by Pope Gregory. That's why it's called the Gregorian calendar. Because it was off. The dates of Easter started shifting. <laughs> Easter for them, Easter was now falling in in uh, almost in September. They were concerned, so they had to change the count again and, and bring it back. But so the count is so. If you're going to go into that, it's it's not you're going to lose yourself. And plus, you'll be see you're going to concern yourself with trying to make predictions over matters you have no control of, and you're just going to waste your time trying to do that. Now, there are indicators that you can use to anticipate a rough timeline. And this is the whole point of this kind of a study is to be able to recognize the signs and anticipate how much, how much do you actually have remaining as a leeway, you see? So one particular indicator, I mean, many of these indicators happened during the Prophet Sallallahu time to indicate that his release had, had taken place then. That was the first khuruj. Now, there are other indicators throughout history. The main thing is not for you to start calculating when he's going to come, when is Imam Mahdi coming, is he born yet, is he come yet, is he there yet? You know, that's not what the signs are meant for. They're meant for you to evaluate what position are you in, in the world right now? What's your life like? Are you able to see whether you're going down the wrong path? That's the whole point. So you recognize certain elements and you investigate and say, well, huh, this doesn't seem to be headed in the right direction, right? So education is headed in the wrong direction. This is my evaluation in North America. Finance, money, monetary, economics, all these are headed down the wrong direction. Legislation, law, legalities, all headed in the wrong direction. So in my point of view, I would be making the decision of leaving this this region altogether. Whether the Dajjal is going to come here or he's going to come there, or wherever he's going to come is a mute point. What I need to do is be selfish in this regard and say, I need to secure 
my faith and my family's faith and my children's future that's what i need to secure and in, not in terms of material aspects like their career and what not in terms of spiritual aspects i need to ensure that i can raise my children in an environment where they, whereby they would not be influenced by all these dajalic ideologies that's the real threat the real threat is not physical you have to recognize the problems with the muslims are never logistical the problems with muslims are existential once you figure out the existentiality of it then the rest is all just logistics you know figure out what where you're going to live what you're going to do all those things are logistics how you're going to make the move right so yeah don't don't get caught up on the calculation side and people have been doing that for years and they've always been wrong always i have never seen a single prediction made calculably that's right never never i have never seen a single one you're always going to be wrong so don't get into the mode of calculating when he's coming and when he's going to arrive and all that now sorry we had a you know <clears throat> how do we convince others about the dajjal like family members who who deny and call you crazy for talking about about it okay uh see here's here's the thing there are two elements here and because there are two questions here number one it's not for you to convince anyone that's not your job your job is not to convince in so far as dawa is concerned on any matter whether it's islam or is there something specific within islam Your job is just to deliver the message. It's not to convince anyone. Let them figure it out for themselves. Okay. Number two, the fact that you're sounding crazy to them, here you have to re- re- recognize one thing. Here is it's not their fault that you're sounding crazy. Don't fall into the delusion of thinking, ah, these guys are just insulting me for sounding crazy. You have to ask yourself first of all, do you actually sound crazy? Do you have enough knowledge to build a proper argument? Have you had do you have an understanding of how logic works? How reasoning works? Are you following the right epistemology? Do you have enough of a of a of a language a, a mastery of language to articulate your points? Because if these things are not there and you try to speak to anyone, yeah, you're going to sound crazy. <laughs> you'll sound like a nut, you're going to sound like a conspiracy theorist. And again, this is what we say. Don't align yourself to their language. That there includes the conspiracy li- uh, theorists. Don't align. Don't speak like a conspiracy theorist. Okay. Speak the way the Quran speaks. Just take an example of how I have, you know, ri- written this book. It's, it took a long time. I had to go through, refine it, leave it for some time, reread it again. you know a lot of mistakes had to be rectified even just in the language only not just the factual elements in there or the hadith or what not it's, it's and so this is what you it's a, it's a it's a holistic thing scholarship is a holistic approach it's not you could throw in the facts but your language is deficient and so you sound like a complete idiot okay you can cite everywhere you can cite from but then your reasoning is deficient So all that evidence doesn't mean anything because you're not able to present it in the right manner that can make sense that can at least give the other person an inkling as to say hmm let me consider this okay so take these two into consideration it's not about convincing anybody you have to your job is to just deliver the message And so it's best that you figure out how you're going to deliver the message. It's how you deliver the message. It's not the message itself. The message itself can be delivered, but it's how you deliver it which will determine whether or not the other person will receive it. Now. Mhm. Yeah. Well, corruption of knowledge, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. the corruption of knowledge you have to recognize that knowledge itself it cannot be corrupted if it's true if it's true knowledge if it's false knowledge or if it is a blameworthy knowledge yeah it will be corrupted but the if you want, what if you mean by that the education system has been corrupted yeah i agree with you 100% yeah education has been corrupted terribly mhm was it oh mhm 
Because the person is always, for example, he Come is again? solid, for example, right? He's truthful or he's soft. He's always truthful. I'm, I'm not understanding. Oh, based on what he said. Yeah. No, see, you can anticipate. That's that's fine. You can make anticipation. That's a different thing. This is why we, we put it in the chapter there. See, we say there's a difference between prophecy and prediction, but we also say there's a difference between prediction and anticipation of something. See, in, in, in terms of prediction or anticipation, you need to have an understanding of all the conditions and variables. It's not just about causes and effects. I'll give you an example. So I can anticipate that I'll, I'll go home in an hour. I can anticipate I'll go home in an hour. I can even predict that, that at, at, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to go home. I've given you a marker of time. Now, the problem here is that I would be ignorant to ratify that as a truth. Why? Because there are certain conditions and variables that I have ignored. Like what, for example? Like, it all depends on if we finish this session early. If you guys keep me here for another half an hour, I'm not going to meet that, that timeline. See, the conditions and variables are different. And a lot of the conditions and variables are unseen. They're unknown. You have no idea of them. So you cannot formulate an, a whole holistic prediction. Particularly, you cannot give them an element of time because that's something you just cannot measure. Now, you can anticipate an individual can look at the environment and say, hmm, I, you know, the way things are going, I'd be surprised if the, the, the Jal doesn't appear in five years' time. I'd be surprised. See, you see, you're giving a supposition and you have to recognize that that's a supposition. But you can't establish that as truth. It's not, the, it's not truth. It's not absolute truth and it's not fact even. It's just a supposition. You're anticipating. And in some cases, you might come close to that timeline. In some cases, you might exceed that timeline. In some cases, it might come sooner. So you don't know and you have to accept that you don't know. Okay? I hope that, that, that clarifies it. Yeah. You can make anticipations and you can look at political events, your political events, and make anticipations by estimations and stuff. But if you start giving elements of time, now you know you, you, you that's a red flag for you also that you're falling into the you're falling into the wrong uh, path. No. Is it fard to learn the Arabic language to understand the deen? It's not fard to learn the Arabic language. It's wajib. So there's a difference in terminology, just a slight terminology. Additionally, it's not wajib to have to learn the Arabic language to have a basic understanding of the deen. But it is wajib to, to learn the Arabic language if you want to expand your knowledge of the deen. That includes going into the Quran and studying the Quran and the Hadith. Yes. So let me explain how that works. You can learn the deen in any language. Any language you can learn, basic deen. I can tell you that Islam requires that you pray five times a day, that you calculate on a yearly basis how much your standing wealth is and pay a certain amount, a certain percentage from that, that you watch for the moon on every lunar cycle and you start fasting during the month of Ramadan and that if you are able to, you save up enough so that you can go to Mecca and perform pilgrimage. Okay. Did everyone hear that? Did I use a single Arabic word in that? There was, I didn't use a single Arabic word in that. Everything was in English. I have explained to you the basic understanding of Islam and the five pillars using only the English language. Yes, you can do that. You can learn your basic deen in any, any language. But if you want to recite the Quran, you have to learn Arabic enough to read the Arabic, even if you don't understand. So in Salah, you cannot recite the Quran in English or in Urdu or in mother tongue. It's, you should make, even for, for those who have just converted to Islam, you have to make the effort to learn a little bit at least to get you going. Now, if you want to go, say, into fiqh matters or hadith or, or usuli matters or anything, aqidah or, or the Quranic study, yes, then you have to learn the Arabic language. Then it is wajib in that regard, yes. It's, a, it's, not, it's not, now there's a difference between wajib and wujub. Wujub is more of a necessity. Wajib is obligatory. 
In other words, it is, it is a primary requisite. You cannot go into the study of the Quran without the Arabic language or into a more advanced study of the deen without the Arabic language. No, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. Now. You spoke about HT. I'm assuming this is Hizb tahrir and other groups and heavily criticize them for establishing Khilafa. Yet you also say that Khilafa is obligatory. Isn't that contradiction? Isn't that, isn't that, a con isn't that contradictory? Shouldn't we be more united on the matter? Let me answer the first question, the last question first. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. Understand that unity and uniformity. Unity does not mean everyone wears the same hijab and the same khanz, you know, thawb and then have the same one government and one ruler and one everything. That's not unity. That's just uniformity. Okay. And in the past, since the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulafa al Rashidin passed away, Islam has never had a unified governing system. Never. Every region had their own caliph or sultan. And you can look up the history, you will find it. Now, number two, this word obligatory is where Hizbut Tahrir and them fall short because I just explained it right now. The difference between Fard and Wajib and Wujub and there are many other terminologies that are used in Usul. What these people do is they take a word like Wujub and then turn it into Fard. It's not Fard. Establishing Khilafah is not Fard. The Faraid have been clearly outlined as far as Sharia is concerned, what the Faraid elements are concerned. Khilafa is not one of them. The ulama, many of them who looked at this from a political point of view, say that there are certain aspects of the Sharia that cannot be implemented without Khilafa. And so Khilafa is a necessity in those aspects. It's wujub. Okay? I mean, and these are things that we, we can just know. We know that these some things about the Sharia cannot be fully implemented. It's there. It's logical. Like things like hudud punishment, hudud punishment is not you. Uh, the the common person cannot do hudud punishment. No, if your neighbor steals, you don't go there and cut off his hand. No, you have to have a proper legal system, and this can only be done in khilafa. So we recognize that. Yeah, in terms of criticizing HD and all these other groups, I've not criticized them. I've not criticized them. The book that was written was not my book. I'm just an editor on that book. And I wrote my foreword and I gave my understanding after having viewed that, that the content of that book. And my, my statement in there still holds. I'm not going to change that because there are many fundamental flaws that are involved there, particularly the idea of making Islam, uh, sorry, Khilafah a fard. The Khilafah has never been fought for the Muslims. And the issue with them is with regards to their methodology. Their methodology is for the most part contradictory to Islam in the fundamental aspects. In the fundamental aspects. Because for somebody to say that Islam hasn't existed in the world since 1924, that's a completely fallacious statement to make. So by definition, you're saying we are all not Muslims. We are Kafir. Huh? Because that's what you see, they don't know what they're saying themselves. They, they don't know how to reason. They don't know how to argue. And because of these, their arguments are flawed. This is the issue we take with them. And, and honestly, if that's just insofar as their arguments are concerned, I don't see how anyone could trust them establishing a state governance. It's just going to be any other country. There isn't may another country, Islamic Republic of Hizbut Tahrir or something like that, or, or Hezbollah or Islamic the, the, the Republic of Islamic Muslim Brotherhood or something of the sort. Khilafah is near and dear to our hearts. And, and I would say, yes, it is obligatory if your definition of obligatory is wujub. Yani it's necessity to establish certain aspects of the Sharia that cannot be established on an individual level. It can only be established on a collective level where there is a hierarchy of governance. Yes, 100% agreed, definitely. But the mannerism in which that should be established has to be taken with great care. Now, we are this, this all that we are discussing and including what Hezbollah Tahrir is also and all these other groups are saying, doesn't include an eschatology. When you factor in the eschatological aspect into it, that the perspective changes entirely. 
because if we are on the brink of of what we had we have discussed so far in the last what 15 sessions if we're on the brink of that that's a different dynamic that has to be taken into account now we would ask the, this question to all these other organizations and political parties what are you going to do what are you going to do when imam al mahdi comes are you going to give him your khilafa that you've established is he going to approve of that khilafa first of all are you going to surrender power yeah yeah we'll do it it's, they've written it in, in their books and stuff yeah yeah we'll do it yeah no problem we'll give it i yeah we we doubt that very much i mean you're calling people kafir and this that and the other you really think imam mahdi is going to be pleased with your endeavors <laughs> yeah allah Mm. Mhm. What was it? Mhm. Russia and China. What can you No. I would say don't expect anything. don't expect anything now you could analyze this from a political point of view but in so far as politics is concerned yeah you could maybe see some support coming from these two but you have to recognize that ultimately the muslims have to defend themselves and muslims have always had to defend themselves always now in terms of politics the field of politics allegiances are always changing so today Today the Muslims for the most part are against the modern west. Likewise, China and Russia being the second other two superpowers in the eastern horizon um are also against the modern west. So yes, our political allegiances are aligned. We have the same enemy. But so when that enemy is removed, then there's a different dynamic playing out. This doesn't pertain our discussion here, but when we talk about Gog and Magog then we are going to analyze that in much greater detail inshallah but don't put expectations on that this is my advice to muslims develop yourselves from within i we looked at those four options that you have from suratul kaf establish yourselves in similar manners the most important of them of all is the knowledge the one thing that we have sacrificed we have ignored neglected and is our greatest demise is knowledge because we were a civilization who was feared not because of our military strength because of our integrity in knowledge and scholarship this is this is what glued us together we we need to if you want to say we want to revive the umma this is how we revive the umma not through khilafa and all that that's secondary that comes afterwards revive the umma through this unify ourselves in knowledge once again not semantic knowledge proper knowledge and you know of the deen no. you said that conspiracy theories are bad and yet many conspiracy theories have a lot of information on what is going on i didn't say conspiracy theories are bad i said conspiracy theories have to be recognized in their own category as conspiracy theories you cannot take conspiracy theories as fact because there are some facts in them and there are many lies in them as well and those facts can keep changing and this is the thing because it's conspiracy theory is a completely semantic study completely 100% semantic study there are no universals in conspiracy theories so you take a little bit and you always take it with a pinch sometimes with a whole cup of salt okay <laughs> don't get caught up in conspiracy theories because here's the thing you get caught up that's one thing you go down the rabbit hole never come back from that number 2 you'll be speaking that language and then you'll wonder why you can't understand the quran because the two languages don't match they don't match so yeah you know they have a lot of information but that's just it i mean you just use the word right there in your question they have a lot of information but they don't have knowledge your knowledge has to come from a different source it has to come from the from the quran and has to come from our tradition that's where your knowledge will come from that information is just a matter of analysis 
And here's the, here's the beautiful aspect about it. The more you increase yourself in knowledge, you will reach a point whereby you will not even need to investigate conspiracy theories. This I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you, you will reach a level of intellective ability whereby you might only just see a heading, you know, a headline, and that will be enough for you. You wouldn't need to look at the rest of it. It'll be enough for you to know whether this is even worth pursuing. I guarantee you, give yourself time and, and, and work on it. You will see. Inshallah ta'ala. Can you comment on, what is this? What is this? Can you read that? This, this word here. Maulana, okay. Can you comment on, can you, can you comment of the Maulana? So, okay, this is why I was confused. Can you comment of the Maulana Imran Hussein's when he said the Quran has mistakes? I suppose you are referring to when he said uh, about the ayah in Surah Zukhruf. La alamun and la ilmun. Okay. I'm not going to comment on whether or, or on what he said. I'm, I've already given you my disposition in, in the book and we explained and we went through the, all those elements. First of all, let me clarify something here. Sheikh Imran Hussein did not say that the Quran has mistakes. Understand what he, what I mean here. He did not say that the Quran has mistakes. And in his book that he has published recently about Isa alayhi salam, I, I forget the whole title of the book, Jesus the Messiah or something of the sort. Um, he, did, he's, he, he did not say, or he has not even written or published, that the Quran has mistakes. What he said was that the, the dialectical marks, the di diacritical marks that have been entered into the writing, into the Mus'haf that was written, he's of the opinion that that could have been a mistake. It's a possibility that that is a mistake that has been done. That's his opinion. That's not my opinion. I'm of the opinion that both are valid. And I have clarified insofar as eschatology is concerned, which one is best applicable, which meaning or which, which word in this case is best applicable for our meaning, our intents and purposes in the study of the subject of eschatology. Khalas, that's where we stand. Now, if he said this or he said the other, here's the thing. See, he, he, he's a scholar of very high caliber compared to someone like me. You see, so he has his reasons. He probably has his reasons of why he said that, that this, are, this is a mistake. I don't think it's a mistake. I don't believe it's a mistake. Personally, I don't believe that it's a mistake. He has the opinion it's a mistake, but that's his opinion. I have the opinion that it's not a, not a mistake. That's my opinion. And I'm taking my opinion because number one, it's not just because there is a, it's a dominant opinion. The ulama have looked at these ayat, the, particularly this one. Fakhruddin Razi has spent almost a page and a half explaining just this one word and the variances. It's not the first time this dispute has arisen. This dispute has been going on for centuries. <laughs> it's going on for centuries as to what it is. So number one, it's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. Fakhruddin Razi spends almost a page and a half just talking about that one word. And if you look, some of the other Mufassirin have also taken a lot of time explaining that. Okay. So I'm going by their opinion because I recognize their scholarship to be much higher than mine. Number two, I'm not just doing a blind followership. I also read what they said and I analyzed it myself. And that my analysis is what I have given you in my book as my findings and my conclusion. So that's my position that I have taken. Okay. That is not a mistake. Both the recitations are fine. However, in the study of eschatology, this word is better applicable in meaning than this other one. Khalas. That's my position. Sheikh Imran is also taking the same point of view. La alamun lisa'a in terms of eschatological study is a better application than la ilmun lisa'a because the interpreters derived from la ilmun lisa'a are ambiguous. The interpretations derived from la alamun, la alamun, la alamun lisa'a is more specific. That's why he's taking that position. But he did not say that the Quran is mistakes. Okay? Now, uh, we have one more. Is there any other question from anybody else? 
this is the last question we have here yeah okay let's do this question then i have heard hamza yusuf saying sufism is ba is not bad and many have said that he is a dangerous sufi and we should not listen to him can you please explain sufism and you mati what is this materialize mentioned you mentioned the sawuf can you please explain okay do we have some time left okay i'll i'll take some time with this one let me let me elaborate a couple of things first first of all saying that a certain scholar is this that and the other that's a bad habit that's a disease that is a disease saying so and so is salafi so we shouldn't listen to him so and so a wahhabi we shouldn't listen to him so and so is a sufi we don't listen to him so and so is a takfiri we don't listen to him so and so here is what you're going to end up doing you're going to shut yourself off from all the scholars of our of our age all of them and people are doing that even to prior scholars oh ghazali sufi oh ibn taymiyah wahhabi I i've heard people doing that <laughs> i've heard people saying ibn taymiyah is a wahhabi they don't even know where the word wahhabi <laughs> astaghfirullah <laughs> Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was a scholar uh, is a contemporary scholar is not is not from Ibn Taymiyyah's time <laughs> the word wahhabi they derived from this from Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab which is a gross misinjustice injustice to him it, because this is it's a it's an insult and a half and i don't know why people do that wallahi i don't know why people do that and then they say ibn taymiyah is wahhabi ibn taymiyah is not what are you saying man subhanallah anyway this idea of doing that you know please don't do that please don't do that i have had teachers who are salafi i have had teachers who are sufi i have had teachers who are maliki who are hanafi who are maturidi who are ashari uh teachers who are shafi teachers who are hanbali teachers who, i've had many different teachers and this is the approach i always took If I saw that a certain scholar was proficient in a certain science, I just went and studied the science with them. I don't want to know. I don't care what the personal beliefs are and anything. Take the knowledge that is there. Whatever their personal beliefs, that's their personal beliefs. Just leave it. You see. and and this idea of saying sufism uh, uh, of of hamza hamza you say hamza use of saying sufism is not bad he's never said that he's never said that he's one of the greatest critics of sufism in our age i would say really he is and the same case goes back to imam al ghazali those who keep calling him a sufi he was one of the greatest critics of his age of the sufis and their ideologies at that time the batiniya as well Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has studied the sciences very carefully. He's not saying Sufism in the same same sense. Sufism is a very broad thing. It's very very broad. There are many aspects to Sufism. And many of those aspects are bad. They are bad. They are false. They are very fantastical and this is completely off the religion. Yes, 100%. people who sit there with gold and 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 tail and uh, you know pe people coming and kissing their legs and all that these are all there but there are other aspects to tasawuf and sufism and tasawuf are two different things people if you go and put in tasawuf in google translate you'll get sufism it's not tasawuf is not sufism tasawuf is a very old term and unfortunately it has been corrupted by all these fantasies and these mystics and all these whatevers okay it's been corrupted by them tasawuf has got only one single and i wish this word was never you know even invented to begin with it's what tasawuf is is ihsan that's what tasawuf in its core in its true aspect entails is ihsan 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 has got these elements tazkiya to nafs matharat al qalb qalb okay purification of the heart cleansing your soul disciplining your soul these are the elements of tasawuf in their true aspects not in those sufi sufi nonsenses this is what sheikh hamza yusuf is talking about now does that make him a sufi allah 
You know, why are you insulting the man? And you see, when you insult the scholar in that regard, you're not harming them. This is your stupidity. You're not harming them. You're only harming yourself because whatever knowledge they have, you've now created a block in your mind against them. You're never going to benefit from that knowledge. <laughs> and this is why for me, whenever I studied with any, any sheikh, any scholar, of course, I would do my vetoing to know. I mean, I don't want to just go and sit with any random individual, but I would do my, my, my due diligence to find out. But whenever I went to sit with any scholar and study, I, I don't care about their personal inclinations, even their political views. You see, I want to study the knowledge. I want to take the knowledge that they have. That's all I have an interest in. <laughs> if I put a block from beginning and say, oh, he's just Wahhabi. I'm never going to benefit. <laughs> or oh, he's just Salafi. And people are calling me the same thing because I've studied with scholars of different backgrounds. <laughs> so apparently I'm all of those backgrounds. People have called me Maliki. Others have laughed at me, called me Shafi. And then I wonder why, why this one is insulting the other one when Imam Shafi was a student of Imam Malik. <laughs> 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 it's so, it's so weird, eh? <laughs> Some of my Ara uh, Arabic teachers, they are Salafi. Yeah, they are Salafi. Aqidah, I studied Aqidah with, with, with some Salafi teachers as well. In doc I studied Aqidah, I studied with Dr. Bilal Phillips. Wallahi, I, and people want to call him Wahhabi and Salafi and this, that. No, these this are the few gems that are left to us in our Ummah today. The few, there are very few gems like these left. And you want to just brand them or oh, scholar for dollar or oh, they have got sponsors or oh, they've got this. How do you know? Where's, where's your Dalil? You know how you keep saying, oh, bring your Dalil, bring your proof. Where is your proof? Where's your Dalil? And don't put up a meme on Facebook and say that's proof. You know, putting up all these posts on Facebook, that's proof, that's proof to you. You're not even worth the time. What? Yeah, there's issues with Sufism, big issues, big problems. There are problems with the Sawuf as well, but it's, it's a very wide science. Okay. And so you have to be careful who you study with. Now, Imam Al-Ghazali was somebody who encountered all these widespread nonsense that the Sufis were giving at that time. And that's why he wrote the Ihya Ulumuddin. He wrote the Ihya Ulumuddin so that he could filter out all that nonsense and put up the core elements of what Tasawwuf really entails. And he didn't just start off with Tasawwuf, he started with the Ilm. And he clarified the different kinds of Ilm. And in Kitab Al-Ilm, he talks about the Sufiya. And he warns you how to identify them. And then he talks about Salah, Zakat, Saum, Hajj. He talks about all the Islamic foundational uh, acts and practices first. And then he goes into Iman into the section of Iman. Then he goes into the section of Ihsan. See, he's, if the Ihya Ulumuddin, if you want to see, it, he structured it very beautifully. It is in line with the Hadith of Jibril. The first 10 books talk about Islam. The second 10 books are focused on the Iman aspects. Then the, the, the next 10 books, the third, they focus on the Ihsan aspect, where he talks about the heart, the nafs, how to purify, how to get rid of the two desires, um, the etiquettes of marriage and all those things. And then in the third, in the fourth quarter, he talks about as -sa and he finishes with the book of death. You see, that's he's gone through it. It took him years to filter all that out, but he's gone through it. Another good scholar is Sidi Ahmad Zarruq. Sidi Ahmad Zarruq uh, wrote the Qawaid uh, al-Tasawwuf. In that he's put all the principles. And in the beginning only, he defines, he starts by saying, we have to define what is Tasawwuf first before we go any further, because we need to remove all the misconceptions. And he says it very clearly that the Sufi must have a fiqh and the faqih must have Tasawwuf. And neither of these can be established without Iman and Aqeedah. And the, if you want to think about it, that's the same thing that the Salafi said. That's the same thing that the Salaf say. You have to establish Aqeedah first. Then you have to have Fiqh. And then you have to purify your heart, your soul, cleanse yourself. Isn't that the principle we talked about? Ahammuha Aqaidun, Thumma al 
The first of which is the aqidah, and then your practice of your deen. Tasawwufun, then purify your heart. Wa'alatun biha shura, then go and do whatever you want to do after that. Pick an instrument and study and move forward. <laughs> We're all speaking the same language. So this idea of name calling and branding and, and then doing it in the public sphere, please, the, you know, let's not degrade ourselves. We're already in a dismal state that that we continue to shame and embarrass ourselves only. And we, then we do this on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube and all these things. Also, and so scholar refuted and exposed. Yeah, fine. Maybe you re exposed and refuted someone. We'll see on Yawm al Qiyamah if you are given a certificate for that. We'll see. If you get a certificate, then we'll give you a thumbs up. Okay, you refuted. Higher. It's like you've achieved something so big when you make a two hour video refuting a scholar and exposing them. Uh -huh. You're going to get your certificate and your trophy on Yawm al Qiyamah for that. Subhanallah, people need to think, you know, grow up, mature. Seriously, grow up. Let's end here. Wallahi, I'm tired. I'm really exhausted. Jazakum Allah khairan for everybody for attending. And I hope that you benefit from what we have discussed. I hope you also um, now take the time and do your own study. I've given you the pointers in the book. Um, for those of you who's... Um, questions were not able to be answered. I'm sorry, I saw a few hands up, but I'm really exhausted right now. So, <laughs> you know, send me an email if you have any questions and we can maybe we'll see if we can arrange for another uh, lecture session or something of the sort in the future. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم رب اغفر لي والوالدي وارحمهما كما ربيان الصغيرة وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهي لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهي لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهي لنا من أمرنا رشدا ربنا علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وارزقنا فهم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين ونور النبيين وحفظ وحفظ المرسلين ونور النبيين وصبر النبيين يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا الله يا الله سبحانك يا الله لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم بفضل سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله جزاك الله الحمد لله